type. So last week we started uh, chapter 12, uh, which the whole theme of chapter 12 is particip try again, participation in God's holiness, which we do uh, through our lives of sanctification. And uh, beginning with uh, keeping our eyes on Jesus as our example and also as the author and perfecter of our faith. And then into this section we're in now, uh, we're going to pick it up in verse 12, uh, which is the main meat of uh, participating in God's holiness. And from there, we've, we will end it with verses 8 to 20, 18 to 24, which talks about how uh, access to heaven is given to us here on earth. Uh, in the action of the divine service. So let's go ahead and read from chapter 12, verse 12. And we'll just go through uh, verse 17 for now. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. And we did cover a little bit of this last week, but we'll just uh, recover it. So this was the part where the preacher, instead of talking about uh, he talked about each of us as runners in a race. Now he's talking to each of us as the body of Christ, one person running a race. And we're all parts of the body of that runner. So now he's talking about uh, strengthening limp, the limp hands, uh, disabled knees to keep running, not to give up not to uh, drop out, uh, drop out of the race. He's actually still talking about us as individuals. Sorry, in verse 12. Uh, strengthen your hands. Don't drop out of the race uh, because you hit the wall. Uh, stay with the team. And this is where he ends talking about us as a team. Stay with the team. Stay with the congregation because by mutual uh, lifting up, we stay in the race together. We're not solitary Christians on our own. We rely on each other's strength to stay in the race. Now here in verse 13, now he talks about us as if we were one runner in the race together as a single body. Okay, so the lame limb is a single person who's weak. So that single person needs, by way of instruction, by way of participation in the divine service, to be brought back to full strength, as it were. Uh, so we should you know, gather together, lift up the ones again that are weak uh, so that we can mu mutually benefit from the gifts that we receive in the divine service. And then in verse 14, now the hearers of the preacher's sermon, which is us two, were being told to pursue peace and sanctification in those exact words. Um, we do not pursue that which we do not have. We pursue that which belongs to us already. Because through Christ, we already have ongoing access to peace, ongoing access, access to sanctification, which means holiness, uh, which we pursue, again, by faithful communal participation in the divine service. And avoidance of what uh, desecrates us. So by a mutual congregation, we partake of the means of grace and receive that benefit, and also by by um, communal participating in each other's lives. We try not to let one of our brothers or sisters fall into something that's absolutely horrible that's going to make them fall away. So we watch out for one another, uh, which is what verse 15 is all about. See that no one comes short of the grace of God. Um, the grace is there. It belongs to us. It's ours by Christ's death and resurrection. So to fall short is to not participate in that. So we pursue that peace and sanctification again by watching out for each other uh, so that no one is left behind, no one is left out. Uh, because what does it mean by fall short? That's what it means by fall short. So by fall short means, well, you know, it's yours. Take it. Um, if 
if you fall short, it means you dropped out of the race. It's somebody got left behind. And we're not not to let that happen. So it's not like there's something you live in your life, and if you don't live your life properly, you're falling short of God's grace. No, that's not what that's talking about at all. It's all these things already belong to us. Uh, it's just a matter of participating in them and taking them. And when we neglect that grace, that's when that door gets opened up. That's, you know, well, I'm not going to go to church this week, you know, and then I'm not going to go to church next week, and then I'm just not going to go anymore. Um, that opens up that door to that, what uh, the one commenter calls secret apostasy. So that's, you're a Christian in name only. You don't really have faith anymore. Specifically, the people in this context are the people that are still following those pagan gods, which they're surrounded by, which we can kind of identify with. I mean, we're not surrounded by pagan temples today, but we're surrounded by paganism in just about every form. We're surrounded by it. We're, we're in a, a pretty godless culture right now. And when we get too attached to the ways of the world, we get too attached to that paganism. Um, <clears throat> And it only takes one, like we talked about last week, it only takes one person to drag an entire congregation down. Now, and sometimes it's the pastor that does that. Uh, one person who has pursuing the world too much, that's the root of bitterness that he's talking about in verse 15. That's actually a, a root of bitterness that was talked about in Deuteronomy 29, 18. That's that single embittered person, that root of bitterness could spring up and drag everyone down with him. And he talks about that more in verse 16, because the threat to us pursuing this peace and satisfaction is someone who is immoral and not immoral like they're a sinner, because we're all sinners, but someone who is completely giving way to godlessness, and they can take all of us down with them. It doesn't mean we're supposed to shun them. It means we're supposed to bring them back into the fold. Uh, Question. Go ahead. Because that kind of, like, in twelve thirteen. So if no one's supposed to be weak, and if there was someone in the church that, you know, we knew was kind of headed down the wrong path. And know, we're all weak at some point. Absolutely. So, so yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But, and, and we recognize that, and we want to help them. Mm -hmm. And we, as a church, try to, you know, kind of steer them back to the, Supposed to the godly ways. Right. How do you not cross that line of then being accused of being judgmental? And uh, yeah, that's kind of hard. It's a tough line because all of a sudden you're invading my private faith, and how dare you right. pass that kind of judgment? Or what are people saying about me? You know, you know, and that's the whole where if you know your brother is doing something, then you go and talk to him, and if he won't listen to you, then you take another one with you, and that's what that's talking about. That's um, what, in Matthew? Right, yeah, and, yeah. and, and so and if uh, he listens to you and turns, you've regained your brother, but if he doesn't, take somebody else, uh, and, and somebody else and somebody else till he sees that this is happening. Yeah, so it's not something that should be taken lightly, and it, we're not talking about like someone is, is like, well, you know, I heard he's going down and getting drunk every Friday night. We're not even talking about that. We're talking about Okay, we, everybody knows this guy's cheating on his wife. <laughs> the whole congregation knows it. We're talking about notorious and public sin uh, and then pretending like they're doing nothing wrong. So it's, it's not a matter of something that's that light where you would easily go, it's like, oh, you know, they may even confide in you because your friends go, hey, I mean, I'm struggling with something, which people do talk about that. Now, this is something that's big. Right, but you don't um, want to push them farther away either. No, you don't. You know, so how do you do that? Yeah, it's like everything else. There's no simple answer. You know, it's uh, how do you go? But you may even have to go, and it's not gossip when you go, I don't know how to approach this someone. You know him better than I do. Don't you think you should talk to him about, about this? That's not a Christian law. That's not gossip. But it may, it may be that. It's like, you know, if I go do this, they're going to see that as attack. If you go do this, they won't take it that way. Were you aware of this? Or am I out of line? I mean, that kind of thing. So, you know, like all things, it's not black and white, and it's not there's a simple solution or a formula or a script we can use. It's case by case. Yeah. Unfortunately, most of the answers are, yeah, let me know how that turns out. 
it's it's absolutely a one-on-one -on -one case by case basis. But the preacher's not talking about your normal everyday kind of sentence here that we all do and that we all know we do. You know, this is someone who's doing something pretty big, pretty public, and it's not a secret. Because secret sins are secret sins. The sins that we do that nobody else knows we do, not that we're keeping them a secret, it's just they're not public sins. We all do those. That, that's what we do. We're sinners. But these are, these are public, big things. Okay, you keep saying the word public. Mm -hmm. What if I was aware that Mr. Smith was having an affair? Mm -hmm. That's not public, it might just be personal knowledge to me. Would I go to him or would I want to maybe come to you as his pastor? Maybe come to me, yeah. Maybe come to me and then we, you know, again, case by case, how do, we, how do we do this kind of thing, right? Because at that point it is public. Someone else knows about it other than them. Uh, it's not broadcast to the whole congregation, but right. it's... It's no longer a private sin when somebody else knows about it. Okay. Yeah. Well, then you would also have to be careful that it didn't become gossip. Right. And that, that's the thing. It's, that, it's, that happens. So, I mean, one or two people may know, but then one person starts talking and then it just gets Right. And, that, and that's, that's the thing that we risk. So that's why the first example I gave is what everybody knows it. And then the second example, yeah, you come to me to talk about how to deal with it because I can't say anything. That's that's one of those privileged conversations. So then it's not gossip. Now, if I go broadcasting it, well, I probably shouldn't be a pastor anymore. But when that when you broadcast that, it becomes gossip, and then that's a whole other thing. Yeah. So this is about. I mean, these are not light issues. These are these are serious issues that he's talking about here. Not our normal everyday. Everyday sins, right? Uh, because when it goes on, when something like that goes on and on, you can see how that could drag down. I mean, that breaks down the faith of an entire congregation. If everybody knows this is happening, but nobody does anything about it, it's like it's like a lot of the things of church discipline that have come up over the years, where a pastor has done something. Where, and I know of one in the Senate right now. He's actually in the Ohio district, where someone is just flat out teaching heresy. And it's like, why is nothing being done? Like, this drags down every single one of us in the office of the ministry is because you got this guy, and you can't, we can't, nothing's being done. He's not, nobody's even talking to this guy. It's like he's publicly broadcasting this stuff. And in today's environment, everybody's just going, well, he's just sounding like all the other churches now. But yeah, that's the problem. Okay? So he's teaching false doctrine, and it's public, and nothing's being done. That drags down the whole church body. Is what a bunch of hypocrites. Because you say you take these vows of the Book of Concord and look at this Yahoo. It's like, yeah, look at that Yahoo. We all know he's there. Everybody's afraid to say anything. Uh, which you guys probably have no idea who I'm talking about. <laughs> which, uh, probably well, you not. Know, yeah, and you don't want to know. Right. He's got a blog, so it's not like it's private. Uh, yeah, and you, you, that happens a lot where you've got false teachers out there, and we'll talk about, actually, we'll talk about them. In, talk about false teachers in the sermon on Sunday, uh, that that happens, and if you don't do anything about it, it just drags down the entire church body, even. It, it, it makes it, okay, what makes you different from all these other churches that supposedly aren't teaching the true gospel, right? So that's an example of how it does it from the top. It's like, how, what else are they teaching in that church, you know? What do those people believe? Are they even really Lutheran? Are they even really Christian? What's going on? It brings the question, and that that's so that's the kind of big stuff that he's talking about. That's disturbing, isn't it? That's very, very disturbing. Yeah. I'm cheating that one person, and not just, and a congregation does nothing for a uh, you know ministerial council or whatever does nothing. Yeah, and. and for example, from the same example I'm making, and other people go, well, aren't you guys just being a little picky because it's doctrinal stuff? It's like, well, he's, he's preaching false teaching about the Trinity. And everybody's going, well, I don't understand the Trinity anyway. So they're just going to kind of go, well, that's theological stuff. That's not really, yeah, but it kind of is. It's kind of key. You think? You know, so, yeah, and you see, it's like, what else is? How can they not do something? A, I'm not going to do nothing to a person. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me, there's people who have been asking that for years. 
out about different other instances where it's just like, well, you don't want to do that. And, and yet guys that are faithful get put on reserve status who can never get another call because somebody didn't like the way they talked to him on Sunday, so they get kicked out. Yeah. But they're, but they were teaching pure doctrine. It's ridiculous. It's just a double standard. It's just one of those dirty church secret things that's out there, which all church bodies have. That we're no different. Um, anyway, so um, again, like we said last week, this is a this is not an either or. It's a both and. You know, like Esau committed sacrilege, right? Because he showed contempt for God's blessing, lost his inheritance, and the result of which included all of his illegitimate marriages he had subsequent to that. All of that action desecrated God's holiness because he had held God's holiness in contempt. And so, you know, that's a big example of, of what the preacher's talking about. And then... It's urge, he's urging, like in this verse 17, he's urging that such behavior be dealt with pastorally for three reasons, that the congregation is not defiled, God's holiness is not defiled, and that the individual will not be rejected on the last day. You know, so you, want to, you don't want anything that's going to desecrate God's holiness. Obviously, that's bad. You don't want the congregation to fall apart. Obviously, that's bad. But most important, which is why it's last in the list, most important is... So that person's faith that they are not lost. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, we have to deal with this, but we don't want them to become a complete unbeliever because of it to lose their salvation. That's not the goal of calling somebody out on something this serious. Um, which makes it even more serious, right? So how do you do that? It's not easy. Uh, which is why a lot of people, a lot of situations, people just don't deal with it. It's like, I don't want to touch this. Anything I do with this is going to be wrong, so they do nothing. It's complicated. When he said, where he found no place for repentance. He, he, came, he came home to repent, and he found deaf ears. They wouldn't listen, right? I could see him not, well, in, in the culture of that time, I could see him not getting the birthright. Mm. And, you know, you know I, I, I got that part, and I agree with that. No place for repentance. Well, in this context, and this is just going by the notes in the Lutheran Study Bible, it's his repentance wasn't true. Right. He was only sorry because of to the extent that it hurt him, and he lost out. He wasn't truly sorry for what he'd done, uh, and that's why he found no repentance. Yeah, I'm sorry I got in trouble. And that's something Luther. But oh, you know, I desecrated God's holiness, and I don't have a problem no, with that. I'm sorry, right? I got caught. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, moving on to the rest of the chapter, starting at verse 18. Uh, For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no, no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I'm full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. And the rest of these verses are not in the lectionary, so we won't cover them, but they just cover other territory we already have. But this is a strong finish to this chapter, that was some big language. Okay, so the preacher's congregation has not come near to the same place with the same revealing of God as did the Israelites at Mount Sinai, right? Okay, so that Old Testament theophany, so you have the fire, you have the voice, God's present on his holy mountain. So that's what theophany is, a revealing the manifestation of God in our physical world which gave them access to seven things. Okay, so something that can be touched. Uh, the paradox of which is that access was forbidden to a place which was at that time physically accessible. They could not go onto the mountain. They couldn't touch the mountain because they would be instantly incinerated, right? Even an animal couldn't touch the holy mountain. They would have been instantly burned up. Uh, 
so they could not access something that was physically acceptable. But what the preacher is referring to is the whole of the Old Covenant and its divine service, what we've been talking about through this whole sermon in the book of Hebrews. So it all goes back to the divine service of the Old Covenant, which did provide limited access to God's presence, right? The glory cloud was there in the tabernacle. Everybody saw it. They knew it was there. They couldn't go in there and touch it. Even the high priest couldn't do that except one day a year. But God's presence was physically, they knew he was there. It was unmistakable. Okay? And the fire is the fire on the, on the holy mountain or in the pillar of fire even, which came, the glory cloud sat on the mercy seat of the tabernacle. The fire is the fire of God's glory, his holy presence. It burns up that which is unclean, right? Can't touch the holy mountain, it'll burn you up. Uh, it burns up that which is unclean and makes the common holy. Okay, it deals out death and it also gives life. That's what the presence of God does. The fire on the altar showed the glory of God to the congregation. And then dark, three things in a row, darkness, gloom, and the storm cloud. So at Mount Sinai, God veiled his glory, right? The fire of his presence was veiled in the storm cloud. He concealed himself visually with supernatural darkness. Uh, he, so he concealed himself in order to reveal himself, if that makes sense. So he knew the fire of God's glory was on the mountain, but he veiled it in the storm so you could at least look at it because just full on is too much for us to take in. So he veiled his glory of his presence in both natural and supernatural darkness. He concealed himself visually in order to reveal himself verbally. Right? So he concealed that holy fire so that his words could reveal himself. Uh, so in a paradox, the fire of God's light was manifest as darkness, which is kind of neat. Uh, their hearing was the only sense that remained effective. Okay, and what did Moses hear? He heard the word, capital W. Right, and then in verses 19 and 20, the blast of the horn that announces the coming of the Lord, right? It summoned the people to him. You can go read about that in Exodus 19. Uh, the herald was so strong that both the people and the mountain itself trembled at the sound. Right? And the voice of the Lord introduced himself by name. I am that I am, right? And he spoke the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. That's Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. Those are the only words God ever spoke to the people without a mediator of some kind. So the divine voice from this fire was so overwhelming that they didn't want God to keep doing it. And that's what the preacher's talking about, right? It was, uh, the sound was such that those who heard begged no further word be spoken to them. Now, when did this take place? Uh, when Moses got the Ten Commandments. Okay. Right, so that's Exodus uh, 20, Deuteronomy 5. Right, so they, that was so overwhelming, they don't even want God to keep doing it. It's like, okay, hey, can we have a middleman? Can we have Moses? Which would they ask, could be Moses be the intermediary? Because this is too much for us. We can't handle this. So they asked Moses to be their spokesman and their representative. And the preacher's getting to a point with all this, because they're like, oh yeah, this is ancient history. We know all this. Yeah, yeah he's getting to his point. So now this... Preacher goes outside scripture a little bit. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling, there in verse 21. Uh, reference to Deuteronomy 9.19. Uh, hmm. Was he actually saying that, that there? I, well, I'm not sure. But the people couldn't bear the sound of the theophany. They could not bear the commands it delivered. What was made visible to, visible to them was terrifying. And even Moses, as the mediator of God's grace in that place, was terrified. Whatever is happening here, you know, whatever Moses did or didn't feel, uh, the rhetorical device he's using with these verbs um, is to associate, he associates the trembling of Moses, the trembling of the mountain, the trembling of the people, 
with the divine service instituted by God through Moses in the tabernacle. So they established, the people established, we want Moses as the intermediary, this is too much for us. Okay, so when God institutes the divine service, Moses is, in, and then Aaron is their intermediary. The, the high priest line. Right, right. Oh, and so now we have a new intermediary. There you go. Sorry. So that, yeah, so that, that's the point he's coming to. So you've come near, right? You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, verse 22, the heavenly Jerusalem and to myriads of angels. Okay, so Mount Zion is Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, which how can they draw near to that? Well, you've come near, it's accessible, but not yet completely, kind of like how God was accessible in the tabernacle, but not completely. They had to go through the high priest on the Day of Atonement. Well, now we have access to heaven on earth in the divine service when heaven comes to earth. So in the divine service, heaven and earth overlap. The congregation comes near to the heavenly realm because the heavenly realm draws down to us, and that is where we participate in seven heavenly realities. There's that number seven again. Uh, the number seven contrasts heavenly things to earthly things. So the whole of the heavenly Jerusalem, the residence of God's people, is now God's dwelling with his people. Okay, so God dwells with us. How does he do that? Mountain, city, and sanctuary have merged into one place. You, you had the mountain of God, you had the city of God, you have the sanctuary of God. They have now merged into one place, which is accessed, again, in the divine service. The Israelites praised God in his earthly temple while the angels sang in the heavenly temple. That's changed. Now, when the congregation comes to Zion in the divine service, it joins with myriads of angels in festal gathering. The angelic army does not come to battle the enemies of God, but to celebrate his triumph over them. By Christ's incarnation and his exaltation, Jesus unites the earthly and heavenly choirs, root, such that the church on earth joins together with the angels in their adoration of God. Again, where does that happen? In the divine service. When heaven comes to earth, that's why we say in the proper preface for the liturgy of the sacrament, whatever the day of day is, or uh, when it's a special one, or the ordinary one is, you know, through Christ's death and resurrection, he is ordained for himself a holy people, therefore with angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven. How do we do that? Because heaven has come to earth at that moment. Those two overlap. So we are literally singing with angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven. We're participating in the marriage feast of the Lamb, which has no end, at that moment in time, here. So we join together with them. And then in the, this verse 23, the general assembly and church of the firstborn. In the ancient world, the firstborn son was the head of the family, right? The heir who inherited the family estate. So God, by the incarnation of his son, appointed Jesus his firstborn messianic heir of all things. So all who share in Christ share in his sonship, which is one of the themes we've had throughout this entire sermon, right? We participate in his sonship, his glory, and his holiness. Uh, that was in Hebrews 3.14 and 2.10 and 11. So the judge of all, God the judge of all, we tend to think of judgment being condemnation. right? That's our modern word, judgment. We automatically think about condemnation and negatives, uh, especially as we see through the eyes of a guilty conscience, which we're really good as Lutherans especially, we're really in tune with our conscience, always being guilty about something. That's like a state of being. Uh, in the Old Testament, God's judgment was regarded in a more positive manner. That was more the connotation of this idea of judgment, of justice, something righting something that was wrong. Okay? Uh, they prayed the Psalms, they asked for judgment, and then they prayed for acquittal and justice. You, know, you pray for God's judgment right alongside justice and being acquitted of your sin. Uh, but the idea of judgment is not just condemnation, but, but fixing what was wrong, 
even in the Old Covenant, as all those sacrifices could not fix the problem of sin. They're looking forward to Christ coming and fixing it. Okay, so the same revealing of God that delivers pardon and delivers justice to those who draw near through Christ also brings accusation and condemnation for those who spurned him, which is what all the warning was about. So, yeah, draw near to Christ. It's going to deliver pardon and justice. Uh, but it's also at the same time when he brings that pardon and justice on the last day, he's going to be bringing accusation and condemnation to those who didn't want anything to do with him. So at the same time, the theophany that we we're talking about, this, this idea of, of uh, you know, God tabernacling with us, it brings life and salvation, also brings death and destruction. Uh, judgment has been a theme that's run throughout this entire sermon. There's a day of eternal judgment that we're to be aware of. And that was in Hebrews 6.2, Hebrews 10.25. Uh, in the theophany of the divine service, which we sometimes forget, the theophany, a manifestation of God in our, in our mortal realm, which happens in the Lord's Supper, uh, we come to the spirits of righteousness made perfect. Uh, these are the people of faith. That was chapter 1038. Did I put 1038 and 39? Yeah. My righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrank back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the persevering of the soul. So those who die in the faith have reached that heavenly Jerusalem. So not only the faithful witnesses of chapter 11 that we heard about, all the saints of both the old and the new covenants, they've finished the race. So now we're fast forwarding to the last day. They've finished the race. They're righteous because they've been justified by their faith that they had in their earthly lives. Because they've died in that faith, their great high priest, faith in their great high priest. They've been made perfect. Therefore, they lack nothing in the relationship with God because God completed his work in them. Right? So their life of faith has reached its consummation. And that is the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And Jesus being the mediator of that new covenant, the sprinkled blood, his blood that was sprinkled on those people of faith and has made them perfect, speaks better than the blood of Abel, which spoke from the ground, which we talked about uh, earlier. And that is the end, of almost the end of chapter 12. So, that's the last day. So in the divine service, the saints here on earth come to the mediator of that new covenant, right? Jesus, as a man of flesh and blood, he is the mediator of the new covenant, just as Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. He was the go-between between God and the people. He spoke what God told him to speak. So, Jesus serves as the mediator by establishing the new covenant during his earthly ministry and now distributing God's promised benefits through his heavenly ministry, right? So he died and rose and instituted the new covenant in his blood and now enthroned in heaven. Now he is distributing the gifts promised by that covenant. So by speaking of Jesus as the mediator of a new covenant, he's alluding to the Lord's Supper. Uh, not very much of an illusion he's talking about the Lord's Supper, right? So that is in which he inaugurated his New Testament and through which he cleanses and consecrates his congregation today by his blood. The Lord's Supper is the new covenant foretold by Jeremiah. We look real quick at Jeremiah 31. Because why do I always go past Jeremiah? There we go. Jeremiah 31, verse 31 says. 31 what? 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
Uh, they will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Pointing toward, uh, pointing toward the second temple and even more pointing toward the new covenant and even more pointing toward heaven. Okay, so the blood of Christ addresses God, God's people with a better message than the blood of Abel because the blood of Christ provides salvation while the blood of Abel speaks only condemnation. The focus on the blood of Christ makes no sense unless it is connected with the Lord's Supper. Uh, here, those who recline at the table hear the blood that speaks the forgiveness of sins, new life, and salvation. Jesus has taken that human blood of the only begotten Son of God into heaven where it has become most holy. It comes down out of heaven and sanctifies. And those who hear the better word that speaks to them as they drink it with faith in that word. So that's another one of the great benefits of the Lord's Supper. But we get that in hearing the word too. So don't think if you never have the Lord's Supper, you're not going to heaven. That's not true. But the Lord's Supper has many and varied and unique benefits, uh, which is what makes it a wonderful thing. Okay, that's chapter 12. Okay, so 13 wraps it all up. There is no way we're going to finish 13 tonight. We'll try. Okay, so we're going to cover 13, only 1 through 17. 1 through 17, is that right? Okay, let the love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves also are in the body. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I will ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. We have an altar from those which, let's try that again. We have an altar which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name, and do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. And that's where we stop. That's the last part of it that's in the uh, lectionary. Okay, so this is the whole wraps it up. This was a really long sermon, by the way. Okay, so this is the conclusion to the preacher's sermon, and it outlines how the congregation possesses God's grace and how, as it possesses that, how they're to offer pleasing service to God, which remarkably looks just like the Ten Commandments being kept. Um, these instructions mix ethics and liturgical matters together, which is confusing to us sometimes. Uh, but how we treat one another is how, treated, how we treat one another is tied to the divine service because the congregation is a liturgical community sharing in God's holiness. So we now are holy brothers and sisters with a heavenly calling. So a couple Greek words because I told you there'd be a couple. One we know already, Philadelphia, right? Who knows what Philadelphia is? Brotherly love. Brotherly love, okay? That's the preacher's first instruction in this concluding chapter that we 
that such love continues as they are now a priestly brotherhood in Christ. And that is the most firm foundation of congregational life, is to remember that we are priestly brothers and sisters. Right? Okay, and then verse 2, we have a similar word, philoxenia, which is kind of cool. It's fun to say, philoxenia. So philo, we know, means what? That's love, right? Philo means love. So everybody know what xenophobia is? Fear of strangers. Fear of strangers. So philoxenia would be? Love of strangers. Love of strangers. Hospitality, right? So continue, not only continue to be a loving brotherly priesthood, but also continue to be a hospitable community. Hospitality to strangers was super prized in the ancient world. Right? Maybe not so much today because a stranger shows up on your house, you want to know, like, why are you here? Right? Immediate, like, questioning. Right? Hospitality to strangers. You show up, a stranger shows up at your door in the ancient world, you invited him in for dinner. Right? That's, that's the way it was. Uh, that was especially prized in the ancient world because outsiders had no legal rights or protection. So if family offered somebody hospitality, that didn't just mean you invited them in for dinner. Now they were under the sacrosanct protection of that family as members of it. So you invite a stranger into your house under hospitality, they're a member of your family while they're under your roof. They have all the same legal protections that your family has. They're one of you while they're under the roof. So that's a little bit different than just inviting a stranger in for dinner, right? Uh, especially like in the Roman world, right? If you invite someone in your home, they are under your protection legally. Okay, so Christian hospitality included Christians escaping persecution. Uh, itinerant preachers like, for example, Jesus was an itinerant preacher, right? As well as others. So that's why I said they knew they may be receiving angels as guests, such as Abraham and Lot did in Genesis 8 and 19, right? You may be entertaining angels unawares. Uh, such receiving of angels may be more common than you think because since the congregation joins with the angels now in the divine service, we sing with them. Uh, and, that, and that's not just a weird statement. It's like we sing with angels on Sunday morning, right? They're, they're there. We can't see them. We're singing with them. So we are entertaining. We are worshiping with angels. It's not such a weird thing. We do it every Sunday. We don't think about it, but they're there. That's happening. Okay, so since the congregation now belongs to the realm of heaven, right? The angels are the companions of the congregation. So we participate, we sing with them, we have them. So everyone says, we really have guardian angels? Yeah, we do. We do. They're, they're with us. The angels are as much a part of the congregation as the people. Uh, and they offer us spiritual and protective <laughs> blessing, right? They do what they do as we do what we do. Uh, so just as we might offer uh, food, shelter, and legal protection to some stranger under the old laws of, you know, ideas of hospitality, so do the angels give to us. They offer us protection. They offer us blessing. Sounds kind of far out there, but that's it. I mean, come on, we all believe that. We all believe we have guardian angels. This is kind of where it comes from. This whole idea of heaven coming to earth and divine service, and, and that's, that's where all that interaction comes from. So now there's a third instruction. It is a call to take care of prisoners and the maltreated. Uh, to make provision for those in prison not only meant visiting them, praying for them, uh, it also meant food and clothing in those days because jailers didn't have to provide that. So if you knew somebody in prison and you wanted to make sure they ate, you had to bring them food or they wouldn't eat. They would starve to death. Uh, a little bit different back then uh, because jailers did not have to do those things. And the preacher calls on their sympathy uh, by telling them to imagine that they're in chains alongside them. Uh, Solidarity with the unjustly imprisoned was uh, their own interdependence on each other, too. So as the body of Christ, 
are being persecuted. Um, and they could even imagine that they could be persecuted for providing the aid to the prisoners. Uh, it was kind of a vicious cycle. And even being persecuted for giving such aid, that wasn't to even be of a consequence to these brothers in Christ. They weren't to even think about that. Uh, persecution was meant to isolate members and destroy the community. That's how that works. Um, that's how it works everywhere. That's how they're trying to do it in Finland right now, right? The bishop just got consecrated. They want to put him in jail for his little pamphlet on transgenderism and how marriage is on one man and one woman. Actually, his wife wrote it. He took credit for it publicly, but she wrote it, and now she's getting persecuted. Uh, but they want to put him in jail, and they want, to, you know, they want to tear down the Finnish Lutheran Church, as they've tried to tear down all the state Lutheran churches in Scandinavia and, and Europe. Um, they're kind of fallen. <laughs> they're falling as they become secular, and then uh, the ones that don't are taken down the head. All right, so that persecution is meant to isolate somebody and then destroy the community by way of doing that, uh, which goes back to what we talked about in the previous chapter where if you have one who is disaffected or whatever, that can drag down the congregation. If they try to annihilate one, that can drag down the congregation. Uh, but in those days, in the early church, didn't do that. That persecution actually consolidated them and strengthened them. And that is exactly what he's talking about in verse, uh, later in verse 5, about the Lord's my helper, I will not be afraid what can man do to me. Uh, but we're jumping ahead. So verse 4 deals with marriage in two ways. Uh, it says marriage is honorable, uh, so keeping it uh, dispels any disparagement of marriage as an institution which was as common in the ancient world as it was today. All right, so the Institution of marriage is a lifelong union between one man and one woman. It is God's priceless and precious gift to humanity, given to be the benefit of all, not only to the people who are married. Uh, because that, that married couple can then be a good neighbor to whoever. Uh, and then the second, uh, in the second way, it regards uh, defilement of the marriage bed, again, to dispel the common view that sex outside of marriage, both held then and now, is that it's uh, okay. Married intercourse is ritually clean. Defiling it not only desecrates it and disrupts the peace of the family as a unit within the congregation, it also desecrates the community in which this takes place. Uh, again, things we don't think about today as they would have taken it a little more seriously, I think, back then. But it's when you think it through logically, you can see how that happens. You know, you, you tear down the family, what happens to society? We see it all around us, right? It starts with attack marriage, and now and then attack social structures, and then see what you have left in society. You have the nonsense that we're dealing with now. Okay, verse 5. The preacher's fifth instruction deals with the congregation's relationship with money. Not their use or their misuse of wealth and possessions, but their lifestyle as God's people. So unlike the pagans, they possess this new life free from the love of money, where they're content with their possessions. We're supposed to be content with our possessions as being sufficient for our needs. We no longer have to be a consumer society, which they had that back then too. Okay, a consumer society with acquisitive values and a fear of insecurity because we are supposed to belong to a community based on Philadelphia, on brotherly love. That's what the preacher's talking about back then. All right, so we don't have a problem with any of this, what I just said, because we're like, oh yeah, that happens today. Yeah, he's talking about back then, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. It's like, were they really a consumer? Society? Yeah, you should read about some of these. Right? Everybody's like, oh, the Romans were so decadent. Yeah, some of the rich ones were. The one percent, <laughs> kind of, because there's a lot of poor people too. But yeah, that one percent, I mean, as oh, we've got like the fanciest fabric that just came in from, you know, Egypt. It might be the ugliest thing in the world, but it was rare and nobody else had it, so they had to have it. Or eat flamingo tongues. Or, or eating flamingo tongues or the ridiculous stuff that they, yeah, I forgot about those. Were the best snails, huge snails from some cave. What was that? 
Yeah, so consumer society, yeah, it was a thing. The latest fashions. It's not any different. Not any different back then. And that's funny to realize they're talking about back then. Mm -hmm. And look how it applies to us today. Again, nothing changes. Okay? They certainly needed money and stuff. We certainly need money and stuff. But the point is we're not to be driven by pursuit of that because we have a more reliable source of security, right? The prom presence and promise of God in the congregation. They had it in the Old Covenant. They had it in the tabernacle. They had it in the temple in the Holy Holies. We have it here on the altar. Heaven comes to earth. That is where our security comes from. The presence of God is there, and then that presence of God goes inside us. Right? Princes and powers, as Luther said. Princes and powers have been able to confiscate land and possessions since the dawn of time. Right? They can take away people's livelihoods. Anytime the baron wants to take away your stuff, wants to take away your land and punish you for being a bad serf, he can. And he can take your life and nobody can do anything about it. Right? And then in the system under which Luther lived, Okay, the prince could have him declared a heretic, and guess what? Anybody could kill him without fear of reprisal because the Holy Roman Emperor declared him a heretic, right? And can princes and powers do that today? Yeah. They hide behind legal stuff. Well, don't we have an imminent domain? And, and isn't that kind of sketchy sometimes? Just as one example? So, hey, the rich can do what they want. Powerful can always do what they want. That's never changed. But they can't take away what God gives us. So even those people back then, it was like, wow, they had no like civil and human rights and all this stuff, but they had, they had security in an insecure society because they had faith. And guess what? We have exactly the same thing. All right, now in verse 6, this is the last Old Testament citation in the book of Hebrews. Verse 6, Psalm 118.6. In response to what has been promised them, the preacher and the congregation can say this verse like a victorious king who was vindicated by God, which is what that verse is about. So, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Okay, they can say that like a victorious king themselves. We can pray it the same way. Vindicated by God because we rely on God and we are delivered from defeat by God. So now the preacher expands to include uh, Christ in a three-part uh, confession of faith. The Lord is their helper, a powerful ally who handed them the victory. I shall not be afraid is a declaration of fearlessness in the face of opposition. And then finally, a boast of triumph. What can any man do to me? We confess by exactly saying what he has said to us. We, get, we are given, God gives us the words and we repeat the words back to him. Right, then in verse 7 and 8, the preacher's sixth instruction is to emulate the former pastors of that congregation. So remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same today and yesterday and forever. So they're told to remember them because they spoke the word of God to them, not because they were awesome. That's how they led the congregation, by being God's spokesman, part of an unbroken chain of speaking that came from God through the prophets, through Christ, to the apostles, to their pastors, and finally to their ears. And they're best remembered for what they taught and how they lived. So did they, did they live as they taught? The churches imitate them by believing what they believed as well as believing as they did, viewing their lives as a whole and dying as men of faith. And what they taught and believed remained because Jesus is unchanging. So leaders may change, but Christ remains. Christ's word remains unchanging. And then their last instruction, in his last instruction in verse 9 warns the congregation against being carried away by strange and diverse teachings. So the biggest threat to a congregation's peace is the spread of unhelpful or false teaching, which destabilizes a liturgical community, which pulls its focus toward something other than Christ. They're called diverse and strange because they appeal to boredom by 
superficial novelty and alien to the Christian tradition unauthorized by Christ and those he's called to teach the word. So that was a lot of words. So what did I just say? And I'm not talking about contemporary worship versus traditional worship. I'm talking about someone that wants to pull in teaching where they say, well, you know, this thing that's going on in the world, we need to kind of embrace that because that's the way the world's going. And, you know, that's, that's what Jesus meant when we're all supposed to love each other. So they didn't have to deal with this stuff back in those days. And, and, and it's where you start soft pedaling all the things we see happening in society. I'm not saying we got to stand there with a sign on the side of the road saying God hates this group or that group, because he doesn't, right? But starting to say, well, the Ten Commandments don't really mean what they say. You have, because people are bored with the same old thing. You know, this world out there is a whole lot more fun, so maybe we can start adopting some of that stuff and looking more that way. And, yeah, that doesn't work out so well for the church when we do that. Um, what the preacher is dealing with in that time for these, this congregation that's hearing the sermon is not specified, but we have a pretty good idea based on some of the other things that he has taught us through this sermon. Uh, is people holding on to the old covenant traditions? Because again, these are Hebrews in Rome. Hebrews... Jews who have converted to Christianity living in the heart of pagan Rome. And when you're raised in the faith and you're raised in a foreign land in, the, in that faith where you have all these traditions and things you can eat and things you can't eat, it's pretty hard to give that up because that's what gives you a cultural identity. And they're clinging to that even though Jesus said, yeah, all this stuff is out the window because I died and rose. This is a new covenant. You don't have to do all this stuff anymore. That's hard to give up. And you turn it into, well, I just do that because it's tradition instead of I have to do this because it's the law. That's a problem. And that's probably what the preacher is referring to uh, because we'll see that in the early church when we start doing Acts. That was the big friction between Paul and Peter. Uh, one of the big frictions between Paul and Peter is, is talking about things, what you can and can't eat, what you can do and can't do. So the preacher doesn't condemn the practice. He doesn't come right out, but he's being a good pastor and he's being tactful and just saying that this stuff's not helpful. Okay, It doesn't accomplish what it says they accomplish because that doesn't have to be accomplished anymore. It might make people feel good, but don't make consciences. It might make people feel good to follow those traditions, like I just said. It might make them feel good to do what's comfortable, but... Do not make their consciences burdened to think that their status before God is certain because of what they do or what they eat. All right. And then on verse 10, uh, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. Um, the focus of this verse is one of uh, specific, the specific functioning of the altar of the burnt offering. Right? It provided holy food or the priests who served at that altar. Uh, the congregation, too, has an altar like that now, right? What it is is the single most controversial question in the interpretation of this book. This is like the hardest verse in Hebrews right here. So if you're like, that doesn't seem so bad, good. <laughs> right? This is the most controversial question in the, in the interpretation of the book of Hebrews, and there is no consensus on it. The most likely answer is it's the place of the divine service, which lies between God and the heavenly sanctuary and the church here on earth, which is in keeping with everything else in Hebrews that's talked about heavenly things and earthly things, because we've seen that theme. And by implication, the Christian congregation may eat from it, and we do in the Lord's Supper, ha, during the divine service. Uh, they've interpreted this to mean other things. I really don't know. I'm not even going to introduce it to you and put it in your head. Uh, because it seems clear to us, seems clear to me in interpreting this book that that's, it's talking about our altar. We have an altar. We have an altar for which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. Those people in the old covenant have no right to eat at this new covenant altar, right? Because they don't believe, right? So these people that are still under the old covenant 
want to keep themselves under the old covenant, well, they, they, can't, they can't eat this. They have to let that covenant go. So that's why I think that's a good interpretation of that. Uh, I don't know what else it could be. Okay, verse 11. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the priest as an offering for sin or burn outside the camp. On the day of atonement, right, the priests were not allowed to eat the meat of the sin offerings. It had to be burned outside the camp. Uh, which sets a quote-unquote ritual precedent for the new covenant, right? The old covenant priests have no right to eat the sin offering of the new covenant either, which is what I kind of just said. That is to say Christ's altar. The right belongs to those outside the camp. So that's new. So if all the people outside the camp have the right to eat Christ's sin offering, then they must be ritually clean priests and have no need for any further atoning sacrifice. What did I just say? I said, we're a new people, and we've been consecrated priests of Christ with no intermediary. So we are those outside the camp, especially Gentiles, right? We're those outside the camp, and we're allowed to eat at that altar because Christ said so, right? So old covenant priests have no right to eat the sin offering of the new covenant, Christ's altar. That right belongs to those outside the camp. All the people outside the camp have the right to eat Christ's sin offering, meaning himself, that they must be ritually clean priests. This is what the Horace's book just got done telling us. We are now ritually clean priests. Which, well, that was like back in chapter 6, chapter 5. The preacher went through all that, made us go through all of the procedures. We read all about consecrating priests and consecrating the altar and how all that stuff is now gone because we have a greater high priest after the order of Melchizedek, which he's going to come up again. So we are declared priests in our own right. We can approach the altar directly. We don't have to go through a priest. The priest doesn't have to offer a sin offering on our behalf. Okay, so verse 12. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So verse 12, Jesus is not a Levitical priest, right? He is an eternal priest. He's the last Melchizedek, right? He serves at the true tent, verse, chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. So he doesn't have to offer a sin sacrifice of his own. He's not a Levitical priest. Sin offerings were slaughtered ritually inside the holy place to keep it holy. Jesus died outside the city gate which was common ground that belonged to those outside the congregation of Israel, people who were not, quote, unquote, the people of God, meaning Gentiles. So Jesus' death was for all of them, right? So all of the verses in Hebrews dealing with Jesus atoning for the sins of those he claims as a holy priesthood climaxes right here in this verse. Jesus gives priestly status, privileges, and responsibilities to the new covenant people of God, cleansing them from sin and impurity, and explains exactly what is meant by talking about God's grace. So in contrast with the old covenant prescription about eating blood, we can now consume Christ's body and blood as holy food and holy drink from the altar. So then in verse 13, so let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, for here we do not have a lasting city, we were seeking the city which is to come. So now the preacher ties all of his previous instruction in this chapter to one exhortation, inviting the congregation to join him and all the saints as they go out to Jesus outside the camp. Where is that place outside the camp where Jesus is? It's the divine service again. It's the place where heaven comes to earth, where Christ sanctifies us with his blood, and the place of meeting where his blood gives us access to the whole heavenly realm. Uh, and I kind of wrote myself a note here. It says, note well, this is an insecure place where there is no real earthly protection for disciples. Just as Jesus went outside the city to suffer and die, the congregation may also have to suffer. Suffer with him by bearing the mockery he bore even to the point of bloodshed, which happened in chapter 12, verse 4, we talked about. 
So as a foreign minority with no legal protection, the early Christians, right? They were prone to personal suspicion. They were prone to social misunderstanding. As Jews, they were prone to social misunderstanding. Uh, discrimination, political persecution. They were not under the protection of Imperial Rome for the most part or anybody else. So they go out outside the gate to Jesus and seek safely, safety with him as their only protection. And that's where we're going to leave it for this week because I got more. No, let's finish it. I don't have that much more. It might be a much, bit much, but let's finish it. Okay, so the temptation in verse 14, for here we do not have a lasting city, but we're seeking the city which is to come. The temptation for the congregation is to go along to get along. Isn't that our temptation in every time and place? To become assimilated by the surrounding pagan culture. What's happening to Christianity in America? It's getting assimilated by the surrounding pagan culture. So the preacher reminds us that they have gone outside the walls because they're members of a heavenly Jerusalem. You can see that in verse 11.10 and verse 11.16 and for chapter 12, verse 22. They may not reside yet securely there, but they settle there like the patriarchs, right? Well, I want you to go to a land that you do not know. Okay. Rather than any other place on earth. It's another paradox. We love paradoxes. They're pilgrims on earth, yet they already visit this new place regularly, right? So yeah, we don't have a secure home here on earth. But even as we are pilgrims, as we are wanderers among all these pagans, we do visit this new Jerusalem regularly. Where do we do that? In the divine service. All right, so the congregation is therefore an earthly colony of the heavenly Jerusalem. All right, now why? Now the... Uh, we're an earthly colony of the heavenly of Jerusalem. Rome claimed to be the eternal city. That's what it was. It's still called that to this day. Rome is the eternal city. And the city which is to come actually is eternal. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Verse 14. It's the city that remains together in God's presence. That's in chapter 12, 27. So in verse 15, the preacher's final instruction is to join in the corporate praise of God. And it's the summary of all the previous exhortations. They all exhort the congregation to join corporately in the service and worship of the living God. So against all these Old Testament ceremonies that we heard about, all these Old Testament things the people had to do, now we have a new service. It's, which is entirely a sacrifice of praise. We don't sacrifice animals. We don't shed blood. I mean, other than Christ's blood, which we eat and drink. The sacrifice of praise, it's a thank offering because Christ offered the final and universal sin offering on the cross, right? God told Daniel in Daniel 9.24, there, no, there would be no need for more sin offerings and that is in, uh, mentioned in Hebrews 9.26, Hebrews 10.11 to 18. Uh, Jeremiah also foresaw all sacrifices for atonement would be replaced by a service of thanksgiving in the age to come, which we already read. So now we have a Eucharist. There's that word. That's a Catholic word. No, it's not. It's a Greek word. Greek word Eucharist means thanksgiving. And... Right. Why? That's what we call. That's what we call the Lord's Supper. We call it a Eucharist. It's a Thanksgiving, because the only thing we can offer is Thanksgiving. We've got nothing, so we have a Eucharist, a thanks, a service of Thanksgiving, in which the sanctifying body and blood of Jesus are received with Thanksgiving, because Christ is the host of the holy meal, and He's the High Priest who presents an offering to God by leading the congregation in Thanksgiving and praise. And oh, by the way, He's also the sacrifice the once-for-all sacrifice. So the sacrifice of praise is offered to God regularly, and the congregation offers it every time we gather for the divine service. It's also offered continually 
by the saints and the angels in the heavenly throne room. So that's the, the, the marriage feast of the Lamb without end. That's going on continuously. Always, always, always. And then heaven comes to earth in our service and we touch it a minute. Uh, but then when we reach heaven, it's going ongoing forever. That was in Hebrews 12, 22. It's also Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. It's the fruit of the lips that confess the name of Jesus. It's the fruit of a confession by its product. Its praise, its content is the confession itself and the holy meal that comes within it. It's all these things at once. Uh, yeah, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his good name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Verse 16. Their sacrifice of praise is closely connected with the common offering, which in those days was the food and the money, which also included the bread and wine that was going to be used in the sacrament in the service. They would bring all this stuff into the table, and there would be the bread and wine they would consecrate for the Lord's Supper. Uh, but also, uh, you know, what's left would be distributed to the people who needed it, right? And then the exhortation to offer this leads to the eighth instruction, which is don't forget it. Don't forget that offering. You know, don't forget there's people out there you've got to help. Uh, the practice of well-doing likely referred to uh, both the gifts of mercy for the prisoners and the marginalized and the acts of mercy done after the service in the name of Christ. Uh, so it's all those things the congregation would do after the service finishes and now well, it's not done because we have people to go take care of the shut-ins and the, the prisoners and whatnot. Uh, by these offerings, the congregations also provided the hospitality to strangers, food for prisoners, help for the persecuted, all those things we talked about. And then God is pleased with those sacrifices as he is with our praise and thanksgiving. Uh, so the divine service is thus enacted by thanksgiving to God through Christ and acts of charity done in his name. Okay, so that's all, all that offering. That's all part of it. Right, and then verse 17, the ninth instruction, and the final verse in Hebrews that is in the lectionary, is uh, encouragement to the congregation to heed their present pastor, pastors and discern, uh, defer to them because they're the one that speaks God's word to them. Uh, as we gather for worship. In other words, it's a call to heed God's word because that's all he's supposed to be saying to you. Uh, they defer by going along with what they say and do in accordance with God word, God's word, and they accept them and their authority, their pastor's authority as leaders in the congregation. And that's because the pastors are responsible for them to God, uh, for them and for their souls. So when it says as if, what does it say? Um, blah, 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 blah. obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so on the last day I got to give an account for all you guys and if something happened that was avoidable that's on me because I'm supposed to be watching out for all you guys and all that's what all pastors do so we got some explaining to do on the last day in other words I make light of it but it's, it's kind of serious yeah what do you think about it Okay, so we're responsible to God for the souls that have been entrusted to us. We have to give an account for each and every one of them on the last day. So now they exercise pastoral care for them by caring for them, praying for them. And since the congregation profits temporally here and eternally from their pastor's vigilance, they have much to gain by making their job easier, <laughs> is what it's actually is saying. So... Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you, right? So make it easier for them. If they defer to him, your tasks will be a joy and a cause of thanksgiving and rejoicing in their prayers. So it basically means, you know, don't forget your pastor. We're, we're all brothers and sisters together. We're supposed to all lift each other up. Was that very end? No. Oh. Oh. So anyway, that's it. We're done. We did get through all that. That was a lot. I knew we'd get through it. Huh? I knew we'd get through it. Yeah, we did. That was good. Yeah. So like the whole, I mean, now you can go back and read it 
read Hebrews and just see how it's like, okay, there's all this stuff about the Old Testament. Why did we got to read all that? And then go back to David, don't like all the sacrifices. And then it all comes down to, oh, that makes sense because it's these people, they lived that lifestyle. They lived all those sacrifices. And now it's, well, you know, Jesus. Like, yeah, but we did all, no, you don't got to do all that. And I know that's why the big deal with Melchizedek is it's the only other place in the Bible Melchizedek really gets hammered out is in the book of Hebrews because, well, he's not a Levite. He's after the order of Melchizedek. Again, different. So that's why he can do this. Still, that was a lot of sermon. That, that's a long one. I hope they were sitting for it. I'm pretty sure they were sitting for it. I'm pretty sure. I just think of some of Luther's and they were seeing Luther's, Luther's aren't that long. No, that's pretty long. I mean, the worst ones of Luther's are the weekday ones, not necessarily the Sunday ones, but the weekday ones because they combine Bible study. Because they, there was no such thing as Bible study. It was part of the sermon. So if I was preaching on Hebrews, all this other background stuff that's mm-hmm. interesting gets thrown into the sermon because it's the only way you learn it because they didn't have that. So there's different times. But yeah, some of them go built. Like, what's his name? The king of preachers. What's his name? Ugh, Spurgeon. Those things are just long. I need a dictionary. They use a lot of big words. People were smarter back then. I mean, he uses a lot of like 50 cent words that I don't even know what they mean. <laughs> and, they're, and it's like, it just goes on and on and on. So that's it. We made it all the way through. Whole book of Hebrews. Next week, book of Acts.